longer passage than sometimes, but we're going to look at this story, a um, very familiar uh, story this evening, but we're going to look at this uh, 18 verses here and then draw some things from it that, that I believe will be a, a help to us, some things the Lord has laid on my heart, kind of been, uh, got, uh, saw this in my Bible reading several months ago and I kind of made some notes on it and, and was, and the Lord kind of laid it on my heart over the past week or so that I've been uh, preparing to preach this evening, so we're going to look at this passage and then and then talk about it for a, a few moments this evening. John chapter three verses one through eighteen. If you would just follow along with me this evening as I read, starting in verse number one of John chapter three, it says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou dost, doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and now hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh or, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we, uh, that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I t have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath, hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven." And as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. We see this passage this evening. It's a very well-known passage. It's a very well-known story, the meeting of Jesus and Nicodemus uh, under the, the cover of darkness, so to speak. But we see this well-known story containing probably one of the uh, most well-known verses in all of Scripture, John 3.16. And we see some very important things from uh, this story that I think we can use, we can take the example of Christ and apply to our lives. And what better example do we have than that of the Lord Jesus Christ? But he, I think he sets a very good example for us in this uh, passage that I want to take and kind of look at this evening and help us to become better Christians, to become better soul winners for the Lord. So tonight we're going to look at the subject of a midnight meeting, a midnight meeting, and we'll have a word of prayer and then we'll get into the message this evening. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for all that you've done for us. Lord, I thank you for all that you've given to us. Lord, I thank you for this church and the opportunity to meet here uh, as a church family, Lord, and, and learn from your word. I pray that you'd be with the, the sermon tonight, the, the service tonight. Lord, I pray that you'd be with me as I preach. I pray that you guide my thought, my thoughts and guide my tongue, Lord. I pray that you would help me to say what you would have me to say. And Lord, I pray that each and every one of us would, would leave here uh, more desirous to serve you and more desirous to do something for you. Lord, I pray that you bless uh, now everything that is done and said through the remainder of this service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As I, as I said, we see a very familiar story. I think many of us know, especially if we've grown up in church any length of time, we know of this meeting between Nicodemus and, and Jesus here at, under, uh, at, at night. He come, Nicodemus comes to the Lord and with some questions, some things that he um, is truly desiring to know. And we see that the Lord uh, meets with him here, and we, we can see many uh, things that I think, as I said in the introduction, things that we can apply to our lives. Uh, we need to take the example of Christ, take the example of, of the Lord, and use them to uh, help us serve better, help us to be better witness for Christ, and help us to uh, share the gospel more effectively uh, for the Lord. So uh, first thing we see right off the bat of the story is first we see a, a confused 
seeker, a confused seeker. Uh, in the first couple verses, in verse number two, we see the, the first part of his uh, seeking. He says, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. So we see him seeking the Lord and coming to the Lord even, even at night uh, because he was a, a ruler of the Pharisees. He was uh, someone who was well known. And he comes to Jesus. He says, he, he says Rabbi, which is uh, we know a teacher or, or master. We, we know that you're uh, someone sent from God. We know you're from God because no one could do these miracles if God wasn't with him. But, but can you explain to me a little bit of how that's working? How does that work? How does this fit into the big picture? So we see Nicodemus here. He was an influential man. We see in, in the first verse that there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Uh, we see that he had much uh, power because of his position. He probably had much uh, monetary goods, much money because of that. We see he was a, a member of the Sanhedrin. We don't ever see that word used in Scripture, but we know uh, that that was the, kind of the, the top level of the Pharisees, the, the, the rulers of the Pharisees, as it were, the ones who kind of made the decisions and that, that kind of filtered down through all the Pharisaical thinking. They were the leaders. Um, we see another uh, in another passage that he was one of the people who went and begged for the body of Jesus with uh, Joseph of Arimathea when Joseph went and begged Pilate to give him the body that uh, Nicodemus was one who helped him get the body down and take it and bury it. So we see that he did uh, after this meeting become a follower of Christ. But at this point, uh, at this point at the beginning of chapter 3, he's just a seeker. He's just uh, confused about what the Lord um, is doing. He knows he's obviously heard uh, just two uh, chapters into the book of John. We've already seen the uh, miracle at the wedding in Cana. And, and so uh, the, the Pharisees are kind of taking notice of this man, uh, this man who, who is Jesus, who, that, that is doing some things that, that are um, kind of, they know some things that are supposed to be happening. They, they know the prophecies. They're the Pharisees. They're very well-versed in the law. They're very well-versed in the prophets. They know uh, everything of the Old Testament. And they see some things happening through First John the Baptist, a, a forerunner of Christ, and then through Christ. And so this leader of the Pharisees, Nicodemus, comes to him and says, we know that you're from God because you're doing these miracles, and if God wasn't with you, you wouldn't be able to do them. So he's trying to figure out a little bit what is going on here. And, and uh, very right off the bat, uh, we see his confusion once again in verse number four because Christ, uh, right off the bat, tries uh, to just tell him how he can be saved. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He just right off the bat says, uh, and, and we know here that the kingdom of God is represent representative of being saved, of salvation. It says you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That means you cannot become a Christian. So uh, the answer to Nicodemus's question is, uh, we know you're a teacher from God, and, and we know you're from God because you're doing these miracles. And, and if you weren't from God, you wouldn't be able to do those miracles. And, and Christ's answer is, hey, if, you don't, if you're not born again, you can't become a Christian, which I think uh, many times that would be a good thing for us, that when people ask us questions, say, well, hey, we need to back up. Are, are you saved first? You know, uh, let's, get, let's get this done first, and, and then we'll, we'll go from there. But we see, because uh, we know uh, the verse, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. And, and so if someone isn't saved, if they don't understand something in the Bible and they're not saved, that, that's a very common thing. That, that's a normal thing that the Bible even tells us that they can't understand these things. And, and so Jesus here sets a very good example, and I'm getting ahead of myself a, a little bit, but when a question was asked of him, he said, hey, if you're not born again, you can't enter the kingdom of God. And, and as I said, the kingdom of God is representative of us becoming a Christian. So he's saying, hey, if you're not born again, you, you can't, you're not a Christian, then you're not going to be able to understand these things. But we see a confused seeker here. We see his confusion shown in verse number two, right at the beginning. And then again in verse number, uh, in verse number four, he says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And then again in verse Number nine, we see him say, uh, how can these things be? The, the Lord's telling him of uh, the, the wind blowing and all these things. And once again, uh, in verse number five, except a man be born of water and of spirit. And, and Nicodemus is standing here and he says, how can these things be? How, how can a man be born again when he's old? How can these things be? And so we see that we have a confused seeker, a very, someone who is looking for the Lord but is not understanding everything regarding him. So we see a confused seeker, but next we see a concerned savior. A concerned savior. 
I know that Christ is concerned about this man, number one, because the Bible tells us God is unwilling that any should perish, but that all should come to remission. So we know that Christ was concerned about each and every person. He's concerned about every one of us. But I find it very interesting that he was willing to meet with Nicodemus even at night. It, it was, uh, this was, he was uh, uh, traveling through, he was doing uh, some small miracles. This was right at the very beginning of his ministry. It says that, uh, that uh, the, he came to Jesus by night at verse number, uh, verse number two. So the, the Lord was willing to meet with Nicodemus even at, even at a, what would be considered a somewhat inconvenient time. But the Lord was concerned about the souls of men. He was concerned about uh, those that needed to be saved. He says that uh, those that are whole need not a physician, but those that are sick. And he says in another passage, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. The, the Lord is very concerned about the souls of men. Uh, as he was in uh, John chapter 3, he is still concerned about the souls of men even today. But I think it's very important for us to notice that as I said uh, a moment ago, when the question was first asked of him, of Nicodemus, uh, how, how are you doing these things? We know you're from God, but how is this all working? He answered him with, a, with basically a statement of, if you're not saved, you're not going to understand anyway. So uh, he was very concerned, we see first about the, his soul. Man, before he could understand all the miracles, before he could understand everything that was going to take place, he first had to enter into the kingdom of God. He had to be regenerated as a, into a new creature and, and, and transformed into a follower of Christ, into a Christian. We see that Christ was willing to meet with him, as I said, even at night. And I think it's very important for us to realize the importance of not missing opportunities to give the gospel. To people, I, I know um, each and every one of us could tell a story of how we uh, neglected, or maybe not neglected, but missed an opportunity. Uh, maybe we were talking with someone or having a discussion with someone, and then, and then as soon as they walk away is is the moment we think about uh, giving them a gospel track or inviting them to church or or asking them about their soul. And, and every one of us could tell stories of that, but but we need to make sure uh, that we that we don't do that. We need to strive in our in our life to have a witness on our lips and on our heart and and be thinking about the things of god i uh, i think we could all testify to the fact that whatever we're thinking about whatever's going on in our mind whatever we're dwelling on is what we want to talk about we want to talk about sports we want to talk about uh cars or or guns or whatever you like whatever you like uh to do whatever you like to talk about whatever it may be if you're thinking about those things all the time and you, those things are are in your heart and you're dwelling on them maybe maybe uh there's there's something you've been reading and you're 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 excited about it then that's what you want to talk about i think we can all give examples of that as well but we need to make sure that we have the lord on our mind the lord on our heart the the gospel on our lips so that when we're in a discussion even if it is about the weather even if it's about uh something something benign we can bring up the lord uh, we get so caught up when talking about all everything else uh, around this time of year. People like to talk politics or uh, sports. I know uh, the NBA Finals are, are going on or they just got over. I guess I don't know. <laughs> but I, I know that there's, there's basketball that's almost over and football is just starting up. And, and people like to talk about those things. But, but the truth is we can take even those small conversations and turn them into a conversation about the Lord. And as Christians, that is our job. Our job is to take this example of, of, of Christ. We, we like, like the Savior, need to be concerned about the souls of men. Uh, we need to realize that, hey, I can, I can talk uh, about all these things. I can talk sports. I can talk uh, cars. I can talk things with people. But, but it, the bottom line, what it comes down to is, are they going to heaven? When it comes down to it, we need to be uh, like Christ here. When they say, hey, uh, I don't understand all this stuff about, about God and the Bible and all this, we just need to say, hey, are you saved? You know, and, and, and I mean, we, we need to be tactful, obviously. Don't just be like, hey, you need to be saved, you idiot, and smack them upside the head with the Bible. But, but we, need to be, we need to be willing to, to just, hey, hey I, I need to ask you about your soul. I need to ask you about where you're going to spend eternity. I, I love talking about all this other stuff with you, but I need to know if you're going to heaven. So we see that we, uh, there was a confused seeker, someone looking for Christ. And because of the Savior's concern, or the concerned Savior that we see here in these passages, uh, that he was able to meet with him and able to talk to him for a little bit. But not only have we seen a confused seeker and a, confused, or, and a concerned Savior, next we see a compassionate sermon. We see a compassionate sermon uh, that was preached here in the next few verses. In verses, uh, starting in verse number 3, when he says, Except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. 
Then he continues, Verily, verily, I say unto you, this is in verse number 5, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Not, marvel that... Excuse me, marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and now here's the sound thereof, but I can't not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. We see that the, the Lord comes to him and he's uh, preaching this message to him, short as it was, but it was not one of uh, being better than you or holier than thou. It was a message of compassion. It was a message of him trying to uh, show him his need for salvation. We see that he uh, started reasoning about him with, with life, using the example of being born again and then talking about the weather and, and signs and things of that nature. I'm reminded of the verse in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. It says, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Uh, the, the Lord used that, that perfect example there. He said, come, let us reason together. Let me explain to you. Let me use this example of, of uh, the, the new birth and then tell you a little bit about the wind, how it blows, and, and things of that nature. And we see that he used this uh, time of compassion to, to tell him, uh, to show him uh, that he needed to be saved. Once again, in, in verse number 10 down through verse uh, even through the end of the passage that we read, verse 18, but he says, Art thou a master of Israel? I mean, the teacher in Israel, and, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto you, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. He's, he's saying, once again, making reference to the prophets uh, that have gone before and saying, Hey, they told you, they told everyone that I was coming. And we need, you need to make sure that you don't reject like they did, like they rejected the prophets. And in another passage, he, he talks about how they slew, uh, slew all the prophets and, and, he, and they, they didn't believe them. They cast them out. And he's, he's saying to Nicodemus, hey, everyone rejected the prophets before. You, you received not our witness, but, but you need to make sure that you don't reject me. It's, it's one thing to reject someone who's talking about Christ. But it's something entirely different and something much more devastating to re actually reject Christ. We need to make sure that, that when we're... I know we could give examples of this, and I think Pastor was just talking a couple weeks ago about uh, the one who got, would get so offended when someone would slam the door in their face or not take a track or whatever when they were out soul winning. But uh, the, the fact of the matter is we need to make sure that we don't get so upset about that, that, that we take it so personally because they're not rejecting us, they're rejecting Christ. It's one thing for them to reject us, and, and people are going to reject us. People are not going to like us. They're not going to like uh, something we said or the way we said it or, or whatever. There's a, a myriad of reasons people don't like us. But, but it's, it's one thing for them to not like us, but if they reject Christ, they're going to spend eternity in hell. We need to have this message of compassion. We need to, to reason with them and, and tell them, hey, with, there's a lot of things that you might not understand, but the, the key is that you get saved. The key is that you, you turn to the Lord. As it says, as the, uh, I think it's very interesting that uh, just, just a, a few uh, short, uh, a short amount of time into his ministry, Christ is already telling, um, telling Nicodemus here at verse number 14, that as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, even so the son of man, uh, must the son of man be lifted up? He's already telling him how he's the one who's going to die for sins. He's the one who's going to be uh, lifted up and, and, and his blood be shed for sins. And he's already uh, preaching himself to them. So we see uh, a compassionate sermon is preached, one of reasoning, one of trying to show him his need of salvation, show him that he must be born again, not, uh, the, the new birth, the regeneration into the, into the kingdom of God, into salvation. We see a confused seeker. We saw a concerned Savior. We saw this compassionate sermon. And lastly tonight, and, and probably most importantly, we see this compelling solution, a compelling solution that is given. He gets down to verse uh, number 13 and into 14. It says, uh, that, saying that he, he's the one who, or, or the Son of Man is the one who's been up to heaven. He knows what uh, all of these things. And, and as the, and Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, the Son of Man is going to be lifted up. And then it kind of comes to a point in verses 15 and 16 and then 17 and 18. It says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We see here that the end of his 
is his sermon, his compassionate sermon to him, this reasoning of, of here's, the, here's, how, uh, here's uh, this, this uh, example of a new birth and, and talking about the wind and the, the signs that are to come and, and the one who's going to be lifted up. At the end of all of that, he offers a very simple solution. Believe. Believe. Uh, verses 15, we see, For whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. And again in verse number 16, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse number 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It's simply, believe whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's just simply trusting that the Lord is the one who, who he said he was, the one who died for sins. We see this here in, in uh, as I said, in verse 15, in verse 16, in, in verse 18. He says it over and over again. It's very interesting that he, he reasons with him and he says, you got to believe. Whosoever believes on Christ will have eternal life. Whosoever believes on Christ will have everlasting life. If you believe, you won't be condemned. But if you don't, you're condemned already. And he, he just says, you need to believe, you need to believe, you need to believe. There's too many uh, gospels, I'll, I'll say, there's too many doctrines going around that, that don't want to say that, oh, God loves everyone. God, and, and, and God does love everyone as, as, uh, as far as a father loves them, but, but he doesn't love what they're doing. We're just, just because we're all creations of God doesn't mean we're all children of God. God did create everyone, but only those who are saved are his children. And, and too many... Uh, too many uh, modern churches want to just make us all children of God and we're all just uh, trying to make it through. We're all just trying to make it to heaven. But the fact of the matter is Christ here, uh, our example, he, he says over and over uh, again, whosoever believeth should have everlasting life and, and have eternal life. And, and if you believe, you won't be condemned. We need to not add or detract from the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and, and that needs to be believed. We need to believe that the Son of Man is the one who, who gave his life for us. The one that God uh, sent down uh, to die on the cross for us. The one who God sent to uh, live a perfect life and take our sins upon him. We need to realize the importance of just preaching Christ. In Acts chapter 8, in verse number, eight and verse number 35, let's start in verse number 34. It says, And the eunuch answered Philip, and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. There's nothing else uh, besides that that we need to be preaching. It's, it's important for us to, to preach. Oh, we need to do certain things and there's certain ways we need to live. But, but the, the main goal of the Christian is to preach Jesus, is to tell others about Christ. Once again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and verse number 23, Paul, uh, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes here, But we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block and under the Greeks foolishness, and under them that are called both Jews and Greeks Christ, the, uh, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. We see here that he's saying we preach Christ. How important for us as, as the New Testament uh, 21st century church to remain preaching Christ. To keep on preaching Christ. Uh, we, we see how the Lord is our example. That Christ himself is our example. He's the, the best example we could ever have. Look, I'm all, I'm all for having role, role models. I'm all for uh, having people you look up to. I'm all for having uh, good, godly people that are, are, oh, I would like to have uh, so-and-so's prayer life, or I'd like to study like so-and-so does, or I'm not all for reading uh, books to help make you better, but, but the fact of the matter is that Christ is our example. If we do everything like Christ did, we'd be doing pretty well. And if Christ, uh, talking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, preached Christ... I think it's very important that we preach Christ as well. If Christ was willing to preach himself, I think we should be willing to preach him as well. We see that he tells him to believe. He tells him to uh, believe in chapter, uh, in verse number 15, in verse number 16, in verse number 18. What a compelling solution that he offers to this problem of sin. He, he, tells him over, uh, he tells him about these different things, how a man must be born again of the Spirit. How that he, he's going to be the one, Christ is going to be the one that's lifted up, just as Moses lifted up the servant. And whosoever believes on him will have eternal life. 
We see a confused seeker, and there's many, many confused people, confused seekers in the world today. Now, uh, Nicodemus knew exactly what he was looking for. He knew he was looking for Christ. He knew that he was looking to learn some things from Christ. But there are a lot of people who are seeking something uh, today in the world, and, and many of them don't know what they're even looking for. They're looking to fill an empty spot in, in their life, or they're trying to uh, do, do better. They try to uh, live a better life. They, they maybe go to church once in a while because they think that's going to help. And, and, and so they, they're seeking something, but, but they, just like Nicodemus, are, are confused seekers. They don't know exactly what they're looking for. But we see a concerned Savior. How important it is for us to take on that same concern. If Christ is concerned about the souls of men, it's important for men, Christians, to be concerned about the souls of men. If, if we don't reach them, no one's going to. If we don't reach the people in our community, no one's going to. If the, the Christians don't take, the, take the, the charge to reach the world, who's going to? The world isn't going to do it. Why would the, the world doesn't have anything to offer. The world doesn't know the way of salvation. If they did, they'd be Christians. They wouldn't be the world. We need to, take the, we need to get the concern that Christ had. We need to get that concern. And, and just as God is not willing that any should perish, we need to have that same, that same, uh, that same fire to not, have any, not be willing that any should perish. Uh, I think it was Charles Spurgeon that said, if, if people, men are going to go to hell, uh, let them basically have to step over us. Let us be holding on to them to, to keep them back from hell. That's a paraphrase. I hope he's not watching. <laughs> anyway. um, but but we, need to, we, we need to be so willing to, to do whatever it takes to see souls saved that, that if people are going to go to hell, let them have to jump over me to get to hell. Let them have to bypass me and bypass the cross and, and just completely let them, let them be annoyed at the, how many times I tried to get them saved. Let, let them, when they step uh, in front of God and, and get, uh, when, uh, at the last judgment, when they get, before they get sent to the lake of fire, let them say, hey, hey bro, Brother Sam tried to tell me so many times how to be saved. Don't let them, don't let, let's not let them think that there's no alternative. Let us get the concern of the Savior. Let us, get, let us get that fire and that unction to do something about it. Let us, let us, like God, not be willing that any should perish. We see the concerned Savior. Let's also have a compassionate sermon on our lips. Let's be willing to know what we believe and, and why we believe it. Be able, if someone asks us a question, to, to be able to open and show them to, so that we'll be able to better share the gospel with them. If we know, if, we know, if they ask us a question, we have the answer, that's a, that's a perfect opportunity to share the gospel with them. Let us have that compassionate sermon reasoning with them, showing them their need for a Savior, showing them the, the sin that, that's going to uh, send them to hell, showing them that Christ died for that sin. Yeah. And then let us have that compelling solution, ready to give them. This is going to the highways and hedges and compel them to come. I don't think there's anything wrong with, with, trying, with trying to convince someone to be saved. I'm not saying twisting their arm and one, two, three, repeat after me kind of thing. But, but I think we need to make it as... as, we need to make it as uh, important as we possibly can. We need to emphasize the fact that, hey, th this is important, and if you reject this, you're going to spend eternity in hell. You're going to spend eternity in a lake of fire, not, not, not just a, a place where the soul goes and it is evaporated and, and dis dissipated and, and you just you go into nothingness. No, you're going to spend eternity in a, a literal lake of fire. Make it so compelling that, that really they, hey, if they reject us, like, like I said, they're not rejecting us, they're rejecting Christ. Let them know that if they, reject, if they reject it, they're not rejecting us, they're rejecting Christ. We need to have that compassionate sermon on our lips and that compelling solution ready to say, hey, I, basically, uh, like, a, like Peter did at, at Pentecost when they said, what must we do to be saved? He got to the end of his sermon and, and he told them, hey, you guys crucified Christ and, and, and you uh, took him away. And, and he, he preached this uh, great sermon in Acts. And then they, at the end of it, he, they look at him and say, what, what must we do to be saved? And he didn't uh, notice, he didn't say, oh, just go and live a good life and, 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 and say, oh, oh, we shouldn't have crucified Jesus. No, don't do that. He said, hey, believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. When uh, in, the, in the Philippian jail, when Paul and Silas were singing and, and, they, and the doors came open and they stayed, the Philippian jailer asked the same thing. What must I do to be saved? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. They didn't say, oh, you just need to let us out of prison. No, they, they told him what he needed to do. They had that compelling solution to the problem. They, they realized their, their problem. They needed salvation. But uh, both Peter and Paul and Silas and, and Christ all preached the same message. Believe. 
We need to have that compelling solution on our lips. When we meet a confused seeker, someone looking for Christ or looking for something, we need to have the same concern as the Savior did. We need to have the same compassion in our words, and we need to have that same uh, compelling solution to draw them to Christ. If we take these things that we see here in the, the book of John at this midnight meeting between Nicodemus and, and Christ, if we take these things, I, I believe that we'll become better soul winners. I believe that we'll become better witness for Christ. I believe that when we meet someone that we'll, we'll, we'll take these things and we'll say, hey, we, I need to have a concern. I need to have a compassion for this person because if I don't witness to them, they're going to die and go to hell. And then we'll be able to, to uh, have that compelling solution. Tell them, hey, here's the problem, but here's the solution to it. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. This evening as we leave, I hope that we'll uh, take these things. As, as we start a, a new work week tomorrow, as we start a, on, a, on a new week in between uh, Sundays, this time we can come to church, I, I hope that we'll take these things. And then when we meet someone this week, We'll, we'll realize, hey, it's our job. It's, it's our duty to, to get them the gospel and have that compassion, have that concern, and then, and then tell them what needs to be said. Don't tell them, oh, just, just live a good life, but tell them, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe. The compelling solution to a problem of sin is simply belief in Christ. Trust Him for, for those things. We need to take these things and apply them so that we can better serve Christ and be a better witness for Him in the time that remains.